Welcome back. The title of this mini lecture is Race and Revolution, Part 2. So there is quite a lot to understand when it comes to the experiences of African Americans and the American story, especially surrounding the 1760s and the early 1770s. Uh, and much of this history has in recent years become uh, infinitely sort of more politicized again with discussions surrounding critical race theory and the uh, 1619 project. Either way, again, Race is central to the American story. Uh, the experiences of African Americans in the 1760s and the early 1770s, be they enslaved or not, are central to understanding the complexities of the founding era. Uh, and to say that does not put shame on the U.S. Uh, and are you know they are important for us to better understand our collective past. Uh, so. Let's talk about five things for us uh, to understand that's going to help us to really get a sense of this era. So the first is Washington and the Continental Army. So many of the founding individuals, right, so the individuals who were actively supportive of the American Revolutionary War effort, uh, were slave owners or aided and abetted the process and institution of enslavement. Washington, of course, would be a good example. Uh, Mount Vernon, uh, most pointedly, you know, is a place that many visit today, but we need to acknowledge the fact uh, that, that Washington was someone who was, in the late 18th century parlance, a, a well-to-do planner, right? He is someone who... Uh, very much uh, the wealth that his family had, of course, had to do with slaves. Washington didn't exactly want uh, black men to serve in the Continental Army, but he sort of felt that his hand was forced. Now, uh, black men served in colonial militias. Uh, free black men served in colonial militias, uh, particularly some who had served uh, and fought at, at Bunker Hill. Uh, and this is uh, very true with an individual by the name of Salem Poor, uh, who fought with distinction. But his hand is kind of forced partly by the British and by recruitment efforts that are being done by Lord Dunmore. And so eventually, uh, Washington's going to kind of force the changes too. So that brings us to our second point, which of course would then be Lord Dunmore. So the British, of course, uh, a slave-owning empire themselves, uh, saw an opportunity, uh, particularly within slave-owning colonies, uh, to potentially use uh, slave-owning and plantations and enslaved people as a way to kind of uh, cause a bit of dissension throughout parts of the colonies, and they, they do this. Uh, so Lord Dunmore in Virginia begins a process of recruiting enslaved people uh, to serve in the British Army, with the idea, of course, getting their freedom after this. Uh, Dunmore's work uh, is somewhat successful in that many individuals will flee to British lines, are going to start to, uh, to serve, although many of those who flee to British lines uh, end up subject to the smallpox epidemic uh, that was uh, racking uh, North America and Central America at that time. Uh, and uh, many w would never uh, receive their freedom, but they would die uh, soon after. Third, service in an integrated army. So eventually, right, the Continental Army opens itself to uh, black men serving in the military, and they do. Uh, a few thousand will serve across the Continental Army's ranks throughout the duration of, of the war, uh, and between then and post-World War II, this is perhaps the most integrated uh, the U.S. Army is going to be. Uh, now, the experiences, of course, they had varied widely in terms of how well they were accepted or not, this kind of thing. Uh, but, but their presence uh, is, is there. The figure varies somewhere like 10% of the Army, that kind of thing. Fourth, post-war loyalism and diaspora. 
so after the war is over, uh, some who had served with distinction in the Continental Army expected a measure of, of freedom uh, or better treatment to be accorded them. And of course, there's a difference between abolitionism and racial equality. And of course, while some may have earned freedom, racial equality wasn't really on the table. Uh, others uh, who had uh, supported British efforts uh, now were sort of the question of what to do. Uh, so you had some who, as well in, in free black communities, who remained loyal to the crown. Uh, and so for some, uh, leaving, you know, the United States was really the only way, uh, you know, sort of or only path forward. And fifth, the first Rhode Island. Uh, so the first Rhode Island uh, actually was a, a unit mostly made up uh, of, of black men. Of course, it was partly segregated and it was led by white officers. Uh, but they recruited actively uh, black men. The idea was that you would get freedom if you served. Uh, and they fought with distinction. Uh, between 1776, 77, uh, and all the way through the end of the war uh, in 1781. So uh, black men served with distinction throughout the time period of the, the, the American Revolution, the Continental Army. Uh, and you know this is kind of a, an important element to, to recognize. Uh, British efforts, of course, uh, are part of this, certainly the work of Lord Dunmore. But of course, uh, British treatment here is not exactly uh, good, uh, and the, the terrors of smallpox uh, were, were just that. All right. Thanks so much.